What's up, guys? Alaska Nomad here. <sighs> All right, and I'm gonna do a bit of a continuation off the last video. Now, again, this is all about Artemis Fowl, and if you are completely undeterred and do not wish to have any kind of your mind changed, by all means, go on, view something else, because this is not a move. This is not a video about breaking down everything that Artemis Fowl got wrong. In fact, it is the exact opposite. This video is talking about everything that Artemis Fowl, the movie, got completely right. And this is coming from, again, a huge fan of the books. So don't even try and say that I don't know my source material. In fact, I'm about to prove to you that I know it a lot better than apparently you do. And in fact, as pretentious as it sounds, I will even argue with Owen Colfer, the author himself, that y'all don't know who Artemis Fowl really is. So, let's break down a few things. Let's break down the details of the book. In the book, Artemis Fowl finds, finds the book. The book that is the entirety of the history of the fairies. It is written in Gnomish. It is everything that he needs in order to figure out what he wants to do. In the book, it states that yes, he is the son of a criminal empire that has been around for generations. And it is stated that, you know, he does want to kind of live up to the family name. It does, however, kind of give hints and basically tries to state that Artemis really just, he wants to be rich again. He wants to be a spoiled little brat. That's all he cares about, apparently. According to how all of you are painting him, he doesn't give a crap about anything except getting rich again. He's tired of being poor, he doesn't like it, and he just wants to be rich again. So, after he finds out about the fairy world, he finds out a few things. Things that um, are not really fairy tale, but is actually more factual. Containing the world of the fairies. He kidnaps Holly Short, who, at this point, is completely down on her magic and is being, you know, pressed into this final situation. So, yes, go and get your magic replenished, which requires a special ritual. This ritual involves taking an acorn from an oak tree and burying it in, into a new ground. Doing so replenishes your magic. It is the art of transference. Now, as she is trying to perform this ceremony, she does get the acorn, but it's it gets smuggled as she gets tranquilized. When Artemis is bringing her back, he notices the fact that Root has been following him the whole entire time, and so he threatens her and says, by name, my name is Artemis Fowl, you need to negotiate. And basically, I have one of yours held captive. You're not gonna get her back, until we negotiate. The negotiations begin after a huge giant slew of them trying to actually do it without the negotiation. When that fails, it is further insistent. Root comes in, she makes the demands that she wants, and then Artemis basically tells her, you don't get any of that, this is my freaking game, this is how I'm doing it, and you're going to do it that way. And therefore, he says that, no, no, I know that there's, you know, not this and that and the other thing, but I do know that if you kidnap a fairy, you can hold it for ransom, and I want one ton of 24 karat gold. Now, in the midst of all this, they hire Mulch, and Holly eventually does get a chance to break through the concrete, and she replants the acorn. She gets her magic bag. As Mulch comes in, he ends up breaking the safe and finds the book. Now, at this point, they do honestly think that he that Artemis gave her a truth serum and ensured that hey she told me about all this I basically just forced it all out of her not that he actually got all this information from the book bit of a bit of a detail here sure I won't deny that then when all is failing Briar Cutchin comes in and completely takes over command and goes hey I I'm going to do this now, I'm doing this my way, we're going to send in a troll. And it ends up being the troll that was actually in the beginning of the book that, just as in the movie, they freaking hype him out. He is completely enraged at this point because he's on, hyped up on allergies. 
and all kinds of chaos ensues. Eventually, Artemis and Holly do find that they have to team up. And as after the whole plan has been failed, the gold is being transferred. Now, here is where the actual goal is revealed. In the book, it is stated that he is... It's not actually stated in the book, so I have to backtrack here. Because it's really a subtle hint that you actually have to notice if you're really paying attention. Is that the whole real reason why he wants that goal in the first place is for his mother. His mother, who has gone completely insane because of the loss of her husband. She is delusional. She is hallucinating. She thinks that the suit is her husband. She thinks that her son is her husband. She dresses up in her wedding dress because she thinks it is her wedding day. She is violent. She is horrifyingly mentally unstable. And when the gold transfer is being made, Artemis suddenly makes a 180 flip according to how everybody's painting him and how everybody looks at him and goes, oh, um, you know, actually, I was wondering, could you guys possibly give my mom back her sanity? Um, is there any way that you can maybe help her out? Um, you know, is there something that you can do? As he asks Holly, and Holly decides, okay, fine, I'll grant your wish, I'll help cure your mother, but I'm going to do it for half of the gold. Now, Artemis Fowl knew that this was actually the plan, which is actually why he just so conveniently decides to go, yeah, okay, fine, you can have half the gold, just give me my mother back. Or, or, we go with the actual idea that Artemis Fowl really didn't care about the gold in the first place. He wanted his mom back, and he knew that the only way to get his mom's sanity back was to do all of this, and then use half of the gold that he was going to get from the ransom to make the wish. He knew all of this because he read front to back the entire book and translated the entirety of the book from Gnomish to English and coded all of it, excuse me, decoded all of it, wrong word, and then, boom, sees, oh, oh, oh. So, this is how I'm going to do this now. Now I know what my plan is, now I know what my goal is. Because that's how a genius actually thinks. That's how a criminal mastermind actually works. They don't actually have... The obvious goal is never their actual intentions. Look at any heist movie, look at any villainous type, and every single time you'll find out that their big old giant goal has nothing really to do with what they're actually going for, what they really want in the first place. Half the time, there is a fake heist going on because they're really actually after something completely different. And that's what Artemis Fowl was doing. Now, all of this being point, being pulled into focus. They had to take out the mother for one simple reason. This is why this movie has been jumping back and forth for 20 years, because they have been scared to actually put a child through that experience, let alone the actress herself. They wanted to ensure that no child would be traumatized and would have to go through extensive therapy just to get their sanity back in any way, shape, or form. Honestly, the actor who played Ar Artemis Fowl would have been so much more traumatized than the mother character herself. And you're telling me you wanted to put a child through all that. You're telling me that that is more important to you than the actual plot of the book. Which they did. Now, again, let's point out all the things that the movie did get right. We got correct that... Artemis Fowl comes from a long line of supposed criminals, as you get from the exposition given by Commander Root. She actually states that your family has been in new has been a nuisance for centuries. Still kind of hints at the criminal empire there. You still get a lot of huge hints throughout. You get your father would kill me if he knew I was showing you this. A throwaway line to a lot of you, but to me, that was actually one of the most huge hinting parts because it actually solidified that he was serious. Domovoy was actually very serious. And I'm sorry, I do actually have to... I have to stop myself because I'm going to call him Butler from now on. Because, yes, I... 
I understand a huge point of why everybody doesn't like that because yes, the butlers are not allowed to reveal their Christian name except in the case of when he does, which is when he's dying. So it is the ultimate establishment of trust. <sighs> that being said, if I remember correctly, because huge fan of the books, but yes, it has been quite a while since I've read them, but I still have it all right here. But if I remember correctly, it still states that you don't call him the butler. You do not insinuate the fact that he is a butler. You never actually do any of that because he will, inevitably, he will break your neck for that. Sorry, I had to get up on the bus here for a second. Now! It also didn't ever make sense to me why in the world they, that Owen Crawford did that little plot point in the first place, because why in the world is he never allowed to reveal his name, but we get to know Juliet from the very first moment that she's mentioned. From the very moment that Juliet is mentioned as being not only a butler, but his younger sister, which, you know, they changed to his niece. Okay, fine, cool. I'm willing to overlook that part. But they still included Juliet into the movie. But... Why does she get to have her name stated all over the place like it's nothing if the entire Butler family line is never to reveal their names to their employers or really to anyone? They're not really supposed to reveal their names at all to keep professional distance. The other part that I have a huge problem with this whole plot point is the fact that Dumb Boy Butler is as connected and personally attached to Artemis Fowl Jr. and Sr. as you can possibly get. He, I never, in any of the books, never once got a version of Butler that actually does keep his distance and does keep a professional distance between anyone in the family. In fact, he is as connected and attached as a father figure can be. Cares deeply about Artemis. As you see through everything that he does, as you see through all of his actions, as you see through all of his character, he cares greatly about Artemis, Junior and Senior. Second, huge plot point. Yes, it wasn't for the gold, but the Oculus, the Aculos, which, yes, I know that they stated thousands of times over, is just to make sure that you get the point that it is about the Aculos. They do still insinuate two major things that you are not looking at, apparently. Number one, it is gold. It is a gold magical MacGyver. MacGuffin, excuse me, not MacGyver, MacGuffin. It is a golden MacGuffin. Number two, that is the whole point of him holding the heist. He wants the golden MacGuffin. Number three, again, it is all for the simple purpose of making the trade. Number four, sorry, I know I said two things, but still. The bigger, huger thing is that look at the shape of the atoms. What does it look like? What does it resemble? It resembles an acorn, an acorn, which is used to replenish your magic. And it actually states that the Aculus is the source of all magic. And it is in the shape of an acorn, which actually does resemble a lot of the Eternity Code, but that's beside the point. So yes, there are elements of Archimedes and Eternity Code throw, thrown into this, but honestly, I felt it was more effectively done than it was a giant mess like everyone else like, likes to claim. Another huge point, Julie's Fruit. Now, Julie's Fruit was exactly how, she, how he was in the book. Except played by Dave Beauty Dench. Big, huge things to point out. Her voice. As much as y'all love to complain about her voice, think about how the voice actually comes across in sounds. The voice actually comes across in sounds as though Commander Root was forced to quit smoking cigars. Because that does have the voice of somebody who has been smoking cigars pretty much their whole freaking life. And, you know, maybe in the last century or something, they people were forcing her and saying, nope, you're not allowed to smoke anymore. Ugh, I don't want to be doing this, but fine. And, of course, the censoring part. 
you know, being refrained from having to curse because that was a huge thing about Julius Drew. Just, he was a very, very colorful as far as his language went in the books. Very much loved to use the word Darwin. That we got extensively from Dave Judy Dench as Commander Root. The top of the morning is not so much of a <laughs> friendly greenie as it is a that just sounds like something Rick would say in this moment. Top of the morning to you. Blech. There's the gruffness of the attitude. There is the get the four leaf clover out of my sight. Get out of here before I throw you out of here. Who the heck is this kid? Shut up, Foley. Can anyone ask a rhetorical question around here? All of these lines are fantastic lines of root and gives the full character of root. Really does. But yes, change to a female. Not really that big of a detail for me to overlook because honestly, I'm not a huge thing about the whole changing male to a female deal. I'm okay with that. I really am. Next point. Holly. Very much still to the character. She has a chip on her shoulder, but this time it's not because she's trying to prove herself to an all-male academy, which, honestly, we've had that plot so many freaking times over, I'm so honestly relieved that that is not a huge plot point, because to me, I freaking hated that part of the book. I honestly hated the fact that it was another freaking female character who's just trying to prove herself in an all-male deal. I'm like, just enough, oh my gosh. This, it, it makes men look worse than it does the women trying to prove themselves. But she still has a chip on her shoulder, only this time it is because of her father being a traitor. Her father, who, yes, is never prevalent in the books, but honestly, I'm kind of glad that they threw it in because it's like, you only focus on Holly. You never even discuss anything to do with her family. Like, you never once touch on the, on the rest of the shorts. Just Holly. It's like... I would honestly like to know more about, you know, why she became an officer in the first place. Just to be the first female officer? Or maybe because that's something that her father was, and she wants to be just like her father. Which actually is a huge, beautiful connection point between Artemis Fowl and Holly Short. Is that they are both have, trying to live up to a certain standard that others don't think that they're able to live up to. And you still get a lot of that. Sub Shorty, you still get a lot of hints throughout if you actually pay attention. Haven City. Almost completely lifted from the page. 100% lifted. Down to how their freaking technology works. How their freaking prison system works. The types of creatures that you see in Haven City. So on and so forth. Very, very much, very much to the book. The psychology scene. Very much lifted from the book. To the point that he even makes the exact same points that Artemis does. Almost word for word how he destroys the psychiatrist thinking that that chair is an authentic when it's really it's a fake. Almost word for word. Bringing in Mulch Diggums. The Howler's Peak scene. Almost word for word exactly how it was in the book. Him getting sent up. The fact that he digs his unhinging his jaw. Honestly, if they did not do that to Mulch Diggums, that would have upset me. And yes, it may, I knew for a fact that it was going to be a scene that would make many people squeamish, but it really wasn't. But again, another point on Mulch Dickens and the voice is that his voice comes across as gravelly, which considering the fact that his occupation is eating dirt and gravel and spewing it out the back end, you're going to have a little bit of a gravelly voice when you do stuff like that. I mean, think of any coal miner that is constantly ingesting harsh chemicals. It makes their voice gravelly because they are dealing a lot around coal, dirt, and gravel as well as all the black soot that is, in, that is inside those mines. It makes their voices very gravelly. That's what it does. It's an end up effect. So the fact that they threw that in there was actually fantastic. And honestly, I don't think they really could have done that part any better. Mulch steals the show so freaking much and I love that because Mulch was actually my personal favorite character in the entire book. Not Artemis, not Holly, not Root, not anyone else. It was Mulch Diggums. It was my personal favorite. Always. And they portrayed him beautifully. The way he geeks out over the safe. The way that he's playing with people. The pickpocketing. And especially, my favorite scene is when Holly says, I'm going to need my gun. 
Dom goes to reach into his jacket, and then freaking Mulch just pulls it out of his pocket and hands it over without even looking away. Without looking anywhere else, he just... Yeah, okay, enough. Yeah, here you go. Fantastic! Little tiny nuances like that, little tiny subtle details like that, shows that really, these guys actually paid way more attention than you are willing to give them credit. Yes, they made a lot of creative liberty changes, but one, not gonna put any child through that experience. Number two, you take away the mother, you don't have any actual reason for the gold other than it really is what y'all think it is. That he just wants his gold. He just wants his criminal empire back. Or, he's a kid who actually cares a lot about his family. He does like the business that he's in, sure, but he wants his mom back. He can't have his dad back because he's accepted the fact that his dad is dead. So his mom's all he's got left, and he doesn't want to see his mom the way that he has. You see a lot of that in how he treats his mother, in how he acts on his mother. That he do It's not that he hates his mother completely, it's more that he hates what his mother has become, and he's sad by the transformation that is made to his mother. Anyhow, I am going on and on, and I literally, I could spend hours breaking down why all of you are seeing the wrong version of Artemis Fowl, and why none of you apparently seem to actually be paying any attention to the real details. Instead, you are looking at it word for word and reading just what's on the page and saying, this is exactly what is going on. There is nothing else implied throughout all of this. That's where you're wrong. Artemis Fowl is about loyalty. It is not about the greed. It is about the loyalty. It is about what will you do for the ones you love. And that they got on as accurately as they possibly could. They had every freaking detail down extremely. But the parts that they changed, I understood why. Y'all don't, but I do. So I'll watch this movie a thousand times over. And eventually I will. I'm going to break down an Easter eggs video and showcase you guys what they actually did get right. So maybe, just maybe, you might be able to see that they actually do care about Artemis. I love you guys. I really do. But sometimes you really make me sad.